Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast. It's me, Josh, all alone today. Um, Unfortunately, Kendall is not joining me for this episode today. She is very, very sick. Um, She did not get a lot of sleep the last couple of nights. She's just kind of down and out right now. So I just wanted her to focus on feeling better, you know, taking care of herself. But I am not all alone here on the show today. Of course, I'm joined by our lovely producers, Janelle and Ian. Hello. So, so good to have you here. I'm glad I'm not sitting here literally all alone. So. Yes, we were planning on making you sit alone too. So yeah, that'd be tough. I've done it yeah. before. It's, it's, uh, it's always hard to podcast by yourself. I mean, podcasts are such a conversational you know, form of media, and I feel like it's very tough to just go solo. You know, you got to be very, I guess if you're extremely entertaining, it, it, it works, but it is, uh, it is difficult. I mean, even right now, I'm like, this, this sucks. I'm so used to my lovely, lovely wife over here, you know, chiming in. But nevertheless, we have a, a very, very crazy case for you today. Um, this one, forewarning, is very disturbing, um, but it is also a truly inspirational story of survival. And this poor woman literally went through over a decade of pure hell and managed to come out on the other side. And the case we're going to be covering today is the disappearance of Tanya Cash. Oh man, this one is, yeah, it's a really, really tough one. But uh, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and dive right into things here today, starting with, you know, some background on Tanya. Actually, before I get into it, um, I did want to mention that she wrote a book. It's called Memoir of a Milk Carton Kid. And this book is excellent. Ian actually read it and it was our primary source for this this episode, right? Yeah, I think like re- it's essential to understanding this case because like, yes, the overall just um, like the police search and the fact that she was gone for 10 years is already interesting enough. But the fact that like you can actually see what she remembers recorded on a daily basis through that book was really, I think, what is what's important to this. It's very disturbing, but I think it kind of helps understand where her head was at for those 10 years. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, there's no better way to digest the stories than from the people who actually lived it and actually went through it. I mean, this, this, this particular case reminds me a lot of the J.C. Dugard yeah. Um, case a lot, um, some similarities there, um, but it's also some big differences as well. So let's start at the very beginning of Tanya's life. Tanya Nicole Cash was born to Jerry and Sherry Cash on October 14th, 1981. Before having Tanya, her parents had been high school sweethearts and had moved to the small rural community of Monongahela, Pennsylvania after graduation, which, man, some of those New England names are, are just wild. Definitely, definitely tough to pronounce. So I'm doing my best here, people, uh, to pronounce these correctly. But Tanya was their only child, and you know they really doted on her in her early years. Her father earned a decent living as a union butcher in town, and her mom worked at Mickey D's. Tanya loved to hang out while she was working and was thrilled when her seventh grade bus dropped her off right in front of her mom's location. Now, Monongahela was a pretty small town at the time. Although it was 17 miles outside of Pittsburgh, it felt like it couldn't be further from the big city. Less than 10,000 people lived there, and the town's area was barely two square miles. Tanya spent the first 12 years of her life there and maintained the same friends throughout. I mean, if you grew up in a small town, you know, like you grow up with those around you and you get very close to your friends, and, you know, it can be uh, very idyllic. And that's exactly what Tanya's childhood was, was, you know, really, really fun. It was, you know, pretty idyllic for, you know, her situation. She would go shopping with her mom and her parents would take her on frequent vacations down to Florida, which we love that. Uh, Always a good time down in Florida. By the time Tanya turned 13, she had been to Disney World three times, which is so awesome. But still, as Tanya got a little older, she knows that her parents' marriage wasn't perfect. They'd often go long stretches without speaking to each other, and sometimes they would easily trigger each other's temper. It seemed like they knew how to get on each other's nerves, and there's definitely tension in their relationship for quite a while, and it would flare up um, from time to time. And Monongahela wasn't a perfect place either. 
The family would often visit a yearly carnival at the Aquatorium, and once when Tanya was four, a strange man tried to lure her into his van by saying he had kitties in there. Luckily, Tanya's father pulled her away, but even from a young age, I mean, to have that experience at four, I'm trying to think, you know, could you, do I remember anything from when I was four? Not really, but I could imagine something like that that's pretty significant. Um, you, You might actually remember later on in life. So even from a very young age, Tanya saw how adults could betray children's trust and also what evil exists in the world. And there's people out there that prey upon children. Aside from that encounter, Tanya's early childhood remained pretty innocent. She became involved in Bible school and Girl Scouts and attended church whenever she possibly could. Early on while at Bible school, Tanya made a contract with God to remain a virgin until marriage. But still, Tanya was getting older and she was starting to get crushes on boys in her neighborhood. But since she was little, Ricky, her best friend, hung out with Tanya most days and they would ride bikes at the park, they'd go feed ducks and Tanya had developed a crush on him. Finally, Tanya mustered up the courage to tell Ricky how she truly felt about him. He told her she was his best friend and didn't want to ruin their friendship, but he told her she was really cute and could have any guy that she wanted. So soon, Tanya started to notice the attention she was receiving from boys her age, and her diary was filled with confessions like, I love Brian, I love Mike, or really any other boy she had a crush on that day. She'd even kiss some of them and really enjoyed the innocence of these early loves. But at home, things were starting to change and become more unstable. Her father contracted a severe case of pneumonia, and he was hospitalized for several months. It was pretty serious. Out of work, her mother racked up large debts to support the family, and the stress really began to take a toll on her mental state. And then, Tanya found out that her mother had cheated on her father when she was two, And while they worked past it initially, their marriage wasn't as perfect as Tanya had always thought. So you can imagine how difficult that would be to find out that your mother had cheated on your father. And when you're that young too, that's kind of earth shattering. Absolutely. I also think like with Tanya specifically, like she had spent most days with her mom at this point. Like she was like, she obviously, she loved her dad, but he was working a lot. So to have this sort of information come out about her mother, who she was much closer to. Like, yeah, that's shocking. That's a lot to take in. Yeah, and and, and I guess if you start to really put the pieces together, I mean, you you know, maybe some of the other situations that you've gone through start to make a little bit more sense. I mean, still, you're, you're probably not mature enough to understand the full extent of, of these, you know, these actions that your parents have, have made. But it's definitely going to create anxiety. It's going to worry you. Um, it could ch- change your perspective on your parents altogether. And that's really what happened with Tanya. You know, this revelation really coincided with Sherry's deteriorating mental health. At first, she was just paranoid that someone was stealing her clothes at the laundromat, but soon she'd burst into laughter for no apparent reason. She'd repeat phrases to no one. And eventually, her mother lit their coffee table on fire inside their home, which, you know, those things are, uh, to me, suggest there's underlying mental illness going on. There's some, you know, clearly her mother's not doing well mentally um, and maybe even physically. In 1994, Sherry began having sex with other men for money, and Tanya knew about this and eventually answered the phone when one of these other men called the house. And she recalls telling the man to stop seeing her mother, and then he subsequently called her a little bitch. Um, so things, things are definitely going downhill. When Sherry found out about this, she attacked Tanya with a pair of scissors. And the way that I understand this is like in like a stabbing motion, like I'm going to stab you with these scissors. And luckily, Tanya was physically unharmed, but Jerry, her father, knew that their family could not live like this anymore. So shortly after, he divorced Sherry. And actually, Sherry was institutionalized for a while. And still, this is a lot to deal with for young Tanya. Her father had worked most of her life, and she had spent a lot of time with her mother, like Ian just mentioned. So this sudden change really shocked her. And soon she started smoking cigarettes and acting out against her father. But Jerry still wanted to find a romantic companion. So he ended up meeting a woman named Joanne through a newspaper dating service. And the two soon fell in love. Around 1995, Jerry told Tanya that they would move in with Joanne in the nearby city of McKeesport. 
Of course, Tanya did not like hearing this because she had all of her friends. You know, she spent pretty much her whole life in Monongahela. Why on earth would she want to move at this point? I mean, she's fairly far along in school. I mean, you know, getting into middle school and a middle school, high school, like the last thing you want to do is leave all your friends behind and start over at that point. Especially because at that age, just in middle school in general is such a rough time and you're trying to figure out who you are and you're going through so many changes physically and mentally. And then, you know, her she found out the whole thing with her mom and then her parents got divorced. And it's just, it seems like she had no stability in her life to begin with or very little. And then to have to basically uproot and leave, you know, your friends, the one thing that's consistent in your life. I can't imagine like how difficult that was for her and, you know, how that really like, Imp- made a lasting imprint on her for the years to come. Totally. I think people underestimate the just how impactful it is to uproot your kids and move them, especially with especially if they've been in a school for a long yeah. time. I know like Kendall, one of, you know, one of the biggest points in her life that she remembers and it being a point that caused a lot of pain and anxiety for her and you know that she still deals with uh, somewhat to this day is being uh, you know pulled out of school and starting a whole new school and just how difficult that was for her after she had just grown up with all these people and you know I can relate to that too I mean I I moved you know I went to like 13 different schools throughout my life and and I just know how difficult it was to start over at a at a new school you know, nobody likes being the new kid on the block and it is very, very difficult and very, very hard on, on anybody. I mean, it was hard on me. It was hard on my brother. It was hard on, you know, my friends. Cause I was leaving my friends behind. It's, and, and as a kid, you just don't really understand why, you know, Tanya is like, why are we doing this? And the only thing she can really point to is, well, Joanne wants you to move there. And so as a kid, you're going to be like, well, why the hell are we doing this for Joanne? Like, why are you putting Joanne ahead of me? And that can be very, very difficult to to deal with. And so, as you can imagine, that creates some tension between Tanya and Joanne right off the bat, right? So, because her dad's like, all right, we're going, you know, we're going to this new town, whether you like it or not. And that's going to piss off any, you know, kid or, or teenager. So, it kind of makes sense. I mean, it's like, how do you blame Tanya for feeling this way when that's literally the natural reaction any kid's going to have? So, And it's important, like, this all happened. He divorces Sherry, meets Joanne, and moves to McKeesport in a year. Right. Like, that's fast. It's really fast. Like, even, I remember, like, when my parents got divorced, like, it took, you know, just years before either of them found other partners or like got married to other partners or moved in, especially moved in with other partners. And even still, I like acted out against them and smoked cigarettes and all that just to like piss them off. So the fact that all this is happening within a year, like that's completely, completely earth shattering. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. I mean, again, like you did some of the same things that Tanya did. It's, it seemed, it's like a natural reaction as a kid when you break up the stability, you know, the little stability that she did have, which was very minimal compared to most of us, and take that away from her where she has absolutely nothing at that point. And that's earth shattering. It's like my whole world is over. I'm starting completely over. So it was a big deal. And like to Jerry's, you know, Jerry's point, he's like, well, I'm trying to start this relationship with Joanne, but I have my ex-wife, Sherry, who's clearly not well. Sherry actually tried to break into the house several times and Jerry's like, all right, maybe we got to move away from Sherry so that I can ensure Tanya's safety. So that's, that's what his defense to this would be. This episode is brought to you by Guardian Bikes, which I'm super excited about. Guardian Bikes is a kid's bike brand that specializes in safety and building confident bike riders. Kids are learning to ride a bike these days especially with Guardian bikes in just one day due to the way that they've actually designed their bikes. It's like a sports car low to the ground and has a wide wheelbase. Guardian bikes are also lightweight and built for a small child's body unlike most other kids' bikes, which are just shrunken down adult bikes. They're heavy and they're not really designed for kids. What's cool is that all their bikes come equipped with their patented sure stop braking system, which eliminates head over handlebar accidents, which I think all kids are afraid of. I know I had a few of those growing up. 
And this just never happens with their braking system, and it gives kids a much quicker, more controlled stop. Guardian bikes are sold solely online. They're assembled in their US factory in Indiana and delivered directly to your doorstep, 95 to 99% assembled, which I can confirm is true. They sent us a bike for our daughter who literally just had her birthday here recently and she just turned two. So with Guardian bikes, they have a bike for kids ages two to six called the Balance Bike. And I can't wait for her to start using this here any day now. We ended up getting her the Guardian Balance Bike in Pink Aqua because she's super into pink, of course. And I'm really excited to see how she does on it. And like they say, kids can start learning to ride a bike in just one day with Guardian. All Guardian bikes can be ridden using the same balance bike method and then transition into a pedal bike and there's no training wheels needed, which is really cool and something completely new. What's cool about Guardian bikes is that they have different kids bikes for different age groups. And I gotta say, I was actually really impressed with how affordable their bikes are. They are far less expensive than some of the kids bikes you can find out there on the market. And again, they have all this patented technology and I mean, they're truly the best bikes out there for kids. And you may have even heard of Guardian bikes before because they were on Shark Tank. Mark Cuban uh, invested in this company, which is really cool. Um, I'm a big fan of his and the companies that he gets behind. And it's very clear to me why he got behind this company. They really are doing something totally new and their product is top quality. And what's great too, and another reason why I recommend checking out Guardian Bikes is that they offer a 365 day money back guarantee in case your child doesn't like their bike or you need a different size. They trust in their product that much, which is truly, truly unique. So right now you can shop Guardian Bikes this summer and save up to 25% off of bikes. There's no code needed, plus receive a free lock and pump with your first purchase after signing up for their newsletter. Terms and conditions apply, but again, you can sharp Guardian Bikes. We'll have the link below and get up to 25% off of bikes. No code needed. This episode is also brought to you by Simply Safe. You've heard us talk about Simply Safe before. We love Simply Safe. We personally use Simply Safe. It is the best security system that I've used, and I've used a couple of different ones out there. Let me tell you why. First off, I love that Simply Safe really makes it so you can customize your system for your home and for homes of all sizes. On their website, they have a quiz, and through that quiz, you answer some questions, square footage, rooms, things like that, and it will actually recommend the system for you. But you can also just go and make a totally custom system for whatever situation you need it for, and it is very, very affordable, especially compared to other security companies out there. I mean, we're talking about a dollar a day when it comes to monitoring. What I also love about Simply Safe is they're really trying to innovate this security camera, security monitoring market because I think we're all kind of just used to the same old boring cameras and you know, you never really know if your system's working. You don't really know who's behind those alarms when they do go off, but you can really sleep better at night knowing that Simply Safe's 24/7 monitoring agents are standing by to protect you and your family if someone tries to break in and they send emergency help as soon as you need it. And they actually can log into your system and verify the threat. So say you're on vacation and somebody breaks into your home or maybe you know somebody's watching your house or your pets. If for some reason they trip the alarm, they're actually able to go verify the threat and make sure that it is a threat before they send the authorities there, which a lot of other companies, they'll just, they'll try to get a hold of you. They'll call you or you know if you're out and about, you're on vacation, you don't get back to them. They just immediately send the authorities there. And then you kind of got to deal with you know, what comes next, got the police calling you and, and all that versus these guys will actually verify whether there is an actual break in going on or if it's just something else going on. So I love that they take that one step further. So if you want the same peace of mind that we have and so many of our listeners experience every single day, you know, we're super happy to have partnered up with Simply Safe to offer our listeners 20% off a system. You just visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. And as a Simply Safe user, it really doesn't surprise me that Simply Safe has been named best home security systems by US News and World Report for five years running and the best customer service in home security by Newsweek, which customer service, especially when it comes to your security, is so, so important and they have the best out there. So protect your home this summer with 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash mile higher because there's no safe like Simply Safe. 
If I had to come up with something that I absolutely dread doing or something I'm really just not good at, it's fashion. It's getting my wardrobe together. It's knowing what styles are in. I mean, as you can see on most of our shows, I'm literally wearing like a graphic tee most days, shorts. But you know what service has really helped get my wardrobe you know, into, into this century is Stitch Fix. What's great about Stitch Fix is you actually have a stylist who can help you curate different pieces for you based on what you like, maybe what brands you like, what different styles you're into, but then I don't actually have to do the work and go find those pieces or figure out where they're from. My Stitch Fix stylist does all that for me. They just ship it to me in my Stitch Fix box every month. And I love, I can just try on what I like and then whatever I don't like, I can just throw in the prepaid return bag, throw it in my mailbox, and then, you know, I'm good to go. And then I can just keep whatever pieces that I want. All you have to do with Stitch Fix is you give your stylist your size, your style, your budget preference. I order the boxes that I want and how I want. There's no subscription required, which I think a lot of people think it's a subscription base. I think you can have a subscription, but it's not required. And then my stylist sends five just for me pieces plus outfit recommendations and pro styling tips, which I absolutely need. And it's super simple. You keep what you want and send back what you don't want. It's that easy. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash milehire and get $20 off your first fix. That's stitchfix.com slash milehire for $20 off. Check it out today at stitchfix.com slash milehire. Must redeem within seven days of sign up. So let's talk about McKeesport. McKeesport was only five miles downriver from Monongahela, but really this place couldn't be more different. It was twice the size and population, and McKeesport uh, had been a booming steel town following World War II. However, as the industry left the city, you know, buildings fall into disrepair, people lost their jobs, and many people turned to crime and desperate measures in order to get by. So the whole economy there is just kind of tanking and you know, it's a totally different environment. Tanya and Jerry moved in with Joanne and her seven-year-old son from a previous marriage. And it was clear to Tanya that Joanne strongly disliked her and feared she would be a bad influence on her son. So not a great way to start out this new relationship of theirs. She'd organize activities with the entire family except for Tanya. She'd unplug the phone from the wall when Tanya, you know, would be trying to call her friends you know, just doing all these things that were clearly pissing Tanya off. And like, it just seems like Joanne never was interested in trying to, you know, embrace her as part of this new family that they're creating. She's just like, oh, I don't want you. You know, you're just a pain, pain in the ass. You're a bad influence on my son. So what she want her to do, just like leave her behind. It's just like, I mean, you couple that onto everything else that's happened and you can understand how difficult it would be to be Tanya in this situation. Not only that, they even removed her bedroom door so she had no privacy, which I don't know if you've ever had your parent threaten you to remove your bedroom door. I have. And that is like war, dude. That is like I never had a lock on my door for this very reason. Did you guys have locks on your doors? I didn't for a long time, but that was because our locks were like, they were kind of hard to use. So my mom just removed them. It wasn't really out of punishment, but I I think removing your kid's door to their room is one of the most fucked up things you can do as a parent, in my personal opinion. I think that is such a abuse of power and you know, just because they're kids doesn't mean that they don't deserve some sort of privacy or a place that they can like, you know, call their own space and feel that they can be safe and have, yeah, privacy in it. I just think it's, it is so twisted and doesn't do anyone any good. I hate when I hear about that. It's so awful. Well, it's like, how is that going to help your current situation? You're, you're already complaining about your child being rebellious or, you know, not listening to you. And instead of trying to understand the root issue with them, oh, it's so fucked up. They're like, oh, okay, well, you know, if you're not going to follow our rules, then we're just going to give you no privacy and literally make you hate living here. Which is like, newsflash, kid, if you take away kid, if you don't trust your kid and your kid feels like they don't have your trust, they're they're going to continue to rebel. They're just going to get smarter about being (laughs) sneakier. Like they're going to keep doing this shit probably worse. They're just going to learn ways to hide it from you. And I I just have never understood that you are 
you are just driving a wall between you and your kid and and taking away this like trust of I'm a par- parental figure and I'm looking out for you and I want what's best. And I want you to be able to come to me when you have concerns or when you have problems because I'm here to look out for you. But instead, it's like, oh, clearly, you know, you fucked up. So now you're being watched under a microscope, which, again, like it's the whole thing of like telling your kids like you will never drink or you will never have sex. It's yeah. like they're going to. F- fucking do it most likely they're just going to do it in a way that's sneaky which is probably in return going to make it more dangerous for them 100 percent couldn't have said it better i mean that is i mean i definitely went through some level of this i mean i had no lock on my door and my parents would just like barge into my room uh unannounced um at night and you know catch me staying up like just doing normal teen shit like i want to play video games a little bit more they bust it and take it all away they'd remove the internet uh, router so I couldn't have Wi-Fi access after nine at nine o'clock. But then what that made me do was just be like, oh, if you're going to do this to me, guess what? I'm going to get sneaky and I'm going to figure out how to get around this. And I did. I hacked my neighbor's Wi-Fi network and then I would eventually sneak into the room while they were sleeping, retrieve the Wi-Fi router from their closet, plug it in, use it as long as I wanted that night, hoping that they wouldn't come into my room. I got so sneaky that I would literally because I had like my computer and I would just be playing like video games on my computer. I wasn't doing anything bad, but I wasn't supposed to be doing that. So I would literally take a towel and put it under my door because I knew we were in a ranch. So like there was a hallway and then my parents' bedroom and my bedroom. So it'd be very easy for them to see light coming out from under my door, but I'd get like a towel, place it under my door to make sure no light came out to make it seem like I was asleep. And that worked worked, uh, nine times out of 10 until I eventually got caught and they started learning my ways and and then, yeah, then I was luckily uh, ready to leave home and I did, but I totally understand Tanya's, you know, where, where she's at here. Cause this is just totally, it's just, you're taking all of your rights away from your kids. You're, you're effectively making them want to leave more and not want to be there at all. And then not only that, I mean, she's dealing with her father who's started this new relationship with Joanne and he's putting all this attention onto her very little attention on Tanya. And it it gets to a point where you start looking at the attention that you're getting from your father. And in Tanya's case, it would seem like it was only when they were disciplining her or he was disciplining her. And then that's when your outlook on your parent becomes extremely negative. And you're like, I will literally do anything to not experience this anymore. So I really, really empathize with, with Tanya throughout this, throughout her whole story, because I feel like I experienced a lot of these feelings um, throughout my childhood as well. And I can totally see how she, you know, things will, as you'll see, will escalate here. But going back to her story, in 1995, Tanya began attending her new school called Cornell, which was much larger than her tiny middle school in Monongahela. She was bullied constantly in her first year. She was getting in fights all the time with other girls who claimed she was flirting with their boyfriends. She became friends with one girl named Monica Krim, who introduced Tanya to cutting class, drinking alcohol, and smoking weed, although it sounds like Tanya wasn't really into both of these, but again, this friend introduced her to both of those things. But still, Tanya couldn't trust the other adults in her life. Aside from her parents, Tanya was starting to get sexually harassed by neighborhood men, which is so fucking creepy and sad to even think about, specifically one man whose kids she babysat. And that's like a whole other story in itself. And, you know, ultimately they did catch this guy um, and he he went down for it. But yeah, he was literally like soliciting oral sex from her. Um, and she's literally a teenage babysitter uh, for his kids. And this was like next door, I think, or like down the street. So, and just like, she just seems to run into like all the wrong people constantly throughout her life. And the only person Tanya felt safe around was Monica. All she wanted to do was escape at this point. But around this time, this is when she met 38-year-old Thomas Hose, the security guard at Cornell. So Thomas Hose is, you know, the evil guy in, in this case. And I think it's important to look back at his history a little bit to really get a clear picture of who this monster is. But Thomas Hose was born in 1957, and it's Hose, H-O-S-E, like a garden hose, which is, ugh, just makes this so much worse. But he was born in 1957 and lived with his parents, Bud and Eleanor, in the same house on Soul Street in McKeesport 
his entire life. He had admired police officers and always wanted to become one, but he never graduated high school or obtained his GED, so there was no way he was going to be able to get on the force. So instead of like finding another career path to go down or even something similar to his interests, he's like, you know what, I'm going to resort to drug dealing. And he did that for most of his life. And again, he's still living at his parents' house during all of this, and he was only required to help pitch in for groceries once he reached adulthood. But then he gets this bright idea of like, oh, I'm going to go attend cosmetology school, not because I want to, you know, start a new career path, but no, I want to go there to specifically meet women. And eventually he did. He met his only wife there. The two of them quickly had a son named Justin in 1983, but divorced soon after. Tom would say he took everything but, quote, the shirt off her back in the divorce, which says a lot about him. He returned to his parents' home with Justin and then began looking for new work. That's when he applied to work at a private security firm with many fake references, made-up experience, and zero training. And guess what? This private security firm hired him somehow in 1994. And then what's even crazier is that he was assigned to work security at Cornell Middle School one year before Tanya enrolled. Which honestly, I'm like, do they have some liability in this this case? Like, I mean, the fact that on top of the fact that he just got the job by lying about everything, they also gave absolutely no training about what to do with you know sexual assault with yeah. children or or protecting the children from anything. Like, literally, they were like, stand here, break up fights, check hall passes, you're good. Absolutely nothing else was done to like ensure this guy was actually right for this kind of job. That that's terrifying. And and again, as a parent of a child at that school, you're probably assuming, oh, they've checked these guys out. These guys have tons of training, their background checked or whatever. I know like most schools, even today, especially today, have, you know, security that's not necessarily like police officers. Like there's obviously school resource officers, but then there's always like I they call them different things, campus monitors or like, you know, uh campus security that would drive golf carts around yeah. and you know, they're just kind of there to like enforce some of like the school's rules and stuff. But I mean, it seemed like most of those people were, you know, sometimes they were, you know, did other jobs within the school district before or even former teachers or they, you'd assume that they were vetted by the school district, mm-hmm. right? So I assume because this is such a small town that that's why they went through a private security firm in order to find this. Cause I was like, why, like most school districts hire their own security. You know what I mean? It's, so why is it a private security firm doing this who they have no control over that vetting process that you're then going to allow in your school? Right. It, it seems like it's not that this was a, it's a very underfunded town. Like the schools, just about nothing, anything public gets money at all, really, because it is, you know, everything left. It's just Rust Belt, classic Rust Belt. So they went to this likely cheaper security service and. They basically were just like, yeah, it's just like being a mall cop or whatever. Like, didn't give him any sort of training whatsoever. Or verify his background reference. Seems like there was no background check even done on him, which is absolutely terrifying. So Monica told Tanya that Tom had a reputation for being mean and nasty and to avoid him at all costs. But when he asked Tanya for a hall pass once, he cracked a joke and Tanya giggled. Seemed like Tom had a soft spot for Tanya right off the bat. They began talking more in the hallways, and Tanya started to open up to him about her home life. Again, it's important to note that Tanya didn't have any trusted adults in her life. And so here comes Tom. You know, he's this adult, he's a security guard at the school. And at first glance, it seems like he genuinely cares about her. And he even opened up about his own parents' infidelity, which is extremely inappropriate for. A security guard, especially somebody like this, to do with any student. But he, and to me, this seems very like planted, right? This mm-hmm. is like very, very, very well thought out in like the beginning of the grooming process here. Um, Cause he's like, oh, well, guess what? I've been through this too. And, you know, they're kind of connecting over that. Soon she began writing Tom letters and giving them to him in the hallways. And he, you know, instead of just being like, okay, this is kind of getting weird. Why is this student writing me letters? He's like, Oh, you want to write me some more? And so he would literally ask her for more. 
And then, you know, as that relationship progresses, Tanya started ending some of those notes or letters with, I love you. Just like how she had wrote those other boys who were her age, um, you know, she had wrote about them in her diary. Then Tom starts giving her money for candy and cigarettes, and Tanya would call his house after work. So obviously he exchanged his number with her at some point. Sometimes Tom's mother, Eleanor, would pick up the phone but wouldn't ask many questions. Tom said this was because his parents were afraid of him and that he dominated them. Which, who the fuck says that about their parents? That's the most weird, sketchy thing to say. I dominated them? It's like, I, basically, I rule my house, even though I live there for virtually free with my M leeching off my, my parents. But he knows he's in a position of power. His parents are elderly, so he can kind of just like, and it, he clearly does stuff for them. And it'd be like, if he didn't, I don't know, maybe he didn't do shit for them. I mean, he would do small things like driving them to the hospital or doctor. I would assume so. Something. Right. What value does he bring to them? Right. Not much. Not much. Really, the reason they he dominated them, quote unquote, is because like he would just threaten to kill them all the time. (laughs) Like disgusting. Jesus, man. They're probably terrified of him. Yeah. So it's like, oh, don't piss him off. Just try and let you know walk on eggshells with our son because we don't want him to fucking snap. And behind Tanya's back, Tom proved how disgusting he really was. He'd gloat to co-workers that Tanya was quote-unquote bad news and that she had lied and told people that he molested her even though she never said anything like that. Which, red flags all over the place. And to co-workers, I believe, other security guards at Cornell. Which, that, that is even more alarming to think about. One day, Tanya got into a really nasty fight with other girls at the school, and Tom broke it up and then took Tanya somewhere private. He noticed that her finger was bleeding, and he decided, all right, I'm going to kiss her finger, and then he followed that up with a hug. At this point, Tanya was starting to feel safe and protected. In reality, as we can all see here, Tom was grooming her. But again, you have to remember that Tanya had no other adults in her life that were showing her anywhere close to this sort of attention and care in her 14 year old you know mind you know what i mean so i think a lot of people lose track of that with this and they're like oh she's just like feeding into it but clearly this is some somebody much a predator taking advantage of her and taking advantage of her situation let's not forget too she told him about everything that was going on so he's clearly he knows she's vulnerable and he was like, perfect, great target. Yeah, yeah. He was like, this is the ideal situation for for me because- Her I'm... parents aren't paying attention. Yep. She doesn't have siblings that are watching her closely. So she's clear, she's longing for that attention and you know, having someone actually give a shit about her, especially an older figure. So he's like, great, I'll- be that person a- aka grooming her but of course she doesn't know that no how i mean who's who's informing her that this is a completely inappropriate relationship you know she has nobody there on her side telling her like hey this is you know what are you like this is completely inappropriate this needs to stop immediately you know she's just and again he's he's slowly escalating things as well So it could seem to her innocent in that moment, but obviously Tom knows he has, you know, bigger plans for the relationship. On January 2nd, 1996, Tom found Tanya and Monica cutting class and hiding under the stairwell to smoke cigarettes. She had discovered the spot earlier in the school year and had visited frequently for some sense of privacy. Again, going back to like, I had no privacy. She's looking for privacy and there's that spot under the the stairwell. Tom directed Monica to the front office, but sat beside Tanya alone in that hiding spot. And according to Tanya, in slow motion, Tom kissed her for the first time. A school bell interrupted their kiss, but Tom and Tanya met several more times under the stairwell during the next month in order to kiss. For Tanya, Tom made her feel like the most important person in the world. Back at home, she had started running away at least once or twice a week, and those meetings with Tom felt like, quote, refuge from the turmoil. Now, when Tanya spoke of the issue she was having at home, Tom encouraged her to run away. He gave her instructions for bus routes out of McKeesport and even gave her money for tickets. So he's facilitating this. He's encouraging it. 
And so Tanya keeps doing it. She just kept on running away. And she specifically ran away to her mom's, who was court obligated to return her to her father after every attempt she made. On top of that, Tanya met her mom's new boyfriend, Craig, and according to Tanya, he was just a complete douchebag. Before she returned home, she called Tom from her mom's phone to tell him it wouldn't work. After every runaway, Tanya's father, Jerry, called the police to report her missing, but because this happens so often, the police really just like stopped looking for her completely. And this is, this is very, very sad that they did this, that they didn't take this seriously every time, but you know, I think this was a pretty common thing, especially back back in this this uh, time. And so they're just like, "All right, she ran away again. We got six, you know, runaway reports on her. Oh, another one." And they're just like, "We got bigger things, uh, more important things to do." Tom told Tanya that there was a better way to go about doing this, and he said that she could stay with him for a while. And this would be the first time that Tanya entered Tom's house over there on Soul Street. Tanya was brought to the house for the first time on January 28th, 1996, and she was instructed to stay in Justin's room as his parents couldn't know about her. Justin and Tanya were actually students together at Cornell. They were separated by two grades, but they obviously knew of each other. Tom told Justin to, quote, keep your mouth shut about her. Tanya imagined that Tom's house would be warm and cozy, but in reality, it was outdated and uninviting. I mean, it was a elderly, you know, family home, basically. Their telephone was a rotary and all the furniture was covered in sheets. Just absolutely, just, I mean, I'm just picturing it in my head and it just seems creepy. And if you look at the outside of the house, it's very like old and kind of run down. And I mean, you can imagine what it would look like inside. Tom told Tanya not to leave Justin's bedroom, not even to use the bathroom and that they'd go somewhere else the next day. The room was, quote, the size of three prison cells, and Justin slept on the floor. The next day when Justin went to school and Tom went to work, Tanya locked the bedroom door and sat still, trying to make as little noise as possible. She retreated into the closet if she heard Tom's parents coming up the stairs. She did not use the bathroom for a full 24 hours that first time she was at Tom's house, which is honestly just cruel. But she's like, I have to stay hidden here. That his parents can absolutely not find out that I'm here or this is all over, right? But still, looking at the locked bedroom door, she remembered Joanne taking away her bedroom door at home and thought she finally had some form of privacy. A few days later, Tanya was introduced to Tom's friend and neighbor, Judy Sokol. She was divorcing her husband, Bob, and Bob was a former police officer, and Tom befriended him while he was in court for child rape charges. Following a mistrial, Bob pleaded no contest to indecent assault on a minor and was sentenced to probation that lasted through the 1980s till the early 90s. And despite the divorce, Tom and Judy remained friends as they lived only four blocks apart. Tom and Judy went to talk about Tanya's situation alone while she watched TV. When they returned, Judy told her that her relationship with Tom was inappropriate because again, remember Tom is 38 years old and Tanya is just 14. But she also shouldn't have to remain in her situation at home. And then she went on to say, quote, honey, it's not right to live the way you are. And she encouraged her to go to her mom's one last time, and then drove Tanya to a convenience store, where she then got picked up by her uncle Greg. But then things only get worse from here. When she was en route to her mother's with uncle Greg, uncle Greg tried to rape her in the car. And thankfully, nothing happened, but he dropped her off at another convenience store. She then called her mother, who told her to return to her dad's immediately. Once back home, Tanya tried to tell her dad and Joanne about the attempted rape, and Joanne said, quote, You're lying. And her father just shook his head and said, You need to stop making stories up for attention, Tanya. Which is just like, oh my god. And I don't know, and and again, it's like, I don't know if it's like they truly don't believe her or they just truly don't care. It's very difficult to discern that here, but, or is like, does she lie a lot? Does she make up stories a lot? As far as we know, doesn't seem that that's the case, but, but why would a 14 year old child lie about something like this as serious as this? I mean, that, that is so concerning. Tanya decided then you know what? I just can't live like this anymore. I can't deal with Joanne. I can't deal with my dad anymore. And after that, she stayed with her parents for four more days. And then after that, they wouldn't 
see each other again for a decade. In February 1996, Tom convinced Jody Sokol to take Tanya into her home, and so Tanya arrived there on February 10th. Tanya had left her house that morning, planning to leave before Joanne woke up. However, she was in the shower when Tanya left, and she accidentally dropped her pajamas on the stairs. At this point in time, Tanya was completely convinced that Tom was truly in love with her and really like meant well and was like really going to be, you know, this person, you know, that was going to take care of her, love her, I assume like for the rest of her life. And Tom called her TC, which meant totally cute and kitty because she always talked about wanting a cat, which both of those are horrifically disgusting uh, for this, this type of relationship, obviously. But Tom quickly began to display his true intentions. Later that month, she lost her virginity to Tom on a futon in Judy's bedroom. Oh, just, it's just so disgusting. He was drunk and then demanded sex. I believe he also got her drunk as well or tried to get her drunk. Afterward, Tanya was in physical pain and absolutely ashamed that she had broken her pact with God from all those years ago. Tom then fell asleep immediately, still wearing a condom, and when he woke up, he noticed that blood was still on the condom, and then he said, quote, wow, you really were a virgin after all. Uh, just absolutely, absolutely disgusting. Tom then made Judy alter Tanya's physical appearance because they were worried that police would be looking for her. Despite Tom, Judy dyed Tanya's hair red, which happened to be the same color as his ex-wife's hair. And Tom hated it and ended up making Judy add some blonde highlights to it. When Tom's parents were away, Tanya walked to his house to spend the night there. She always passed a church where police did shift changes, and guess what? Not a single one noticed her. So she's been missing now at this point, and supposedly they should be looking for her, but doesn't seem like anybody cared or even bothered to look at this girl. Um who probably would have matched the description they were looking for walking down the street, which is sad. It seems like there is, you know, they just kind of wrote her off. They're like, she's a runaway. Who knows where she could have gone? Likely she's fine. You know, the furthest thought from the police's mind, in my opinion, is that she was, you know, going to be held captive, you know what I mean? Or taken by a pedophile. So it's just, it's just sad. So Jerry, Tanya's father, is, you know, wondering what's going on with the investigation. What are they doing? Are they doing anything? And he quickly realized, like, the police aren't even getting back to me. It doesn't seem like they're actively looking for her. So he decided to contact the Children and Youth Services in order to have them investigate Tanya's disappearance. And they assumed that her mother was hiding her. And if Tanya were found, she would become a dependent of the state. So, of course, they go and check out, you know, Sherry's house, see if Tanya's there, and they quickly find that she is not there. That's when they contacted Judy Sokol through phone records. But curiously, they did not contact Tom at this point, even though Tanya had called him from her mother's house as well. So it just, this tells me that like the level of investigation that went into locating Tanya at this point is literally zero. Right. I mean, they literally, they go through her mom's phone records and they're like, oh, this Judy person sounds pretty interesting. But then, you know, uh, probably the same day, if I remember correctly, she called Tom as well. And they're like, but nothing with this guy. You know, we don't need to look into this guy yet. Yeah. Not even like, why is Tanya calling a security guard from her middle school? Like just literally no investigation. They weren't looking into this at all, which... It's such a shame because it could have saved Tanya from so much pain and suffering for so many years. But Judy called Tom and told him that Tanya could no longer stay at her house because she's like, oh shit, they're, they're on to me. Even though Tanya and Judy had grown close and Judy was ultimately protecting Tom, she did not want to be a part of this situation anymore. She was already, you know, she was already facilitating, you know, sexual violence, you know, in her own home at this point. So it was already bad. And she... I have to believe that she had a feeling that things were only going to get worse from here. So once the CYS got involved, she's like, all right, they're getting too close to me. I'm going to bail out of this. So for the next four years from when Tanya was 14 all the way up until she was 18, she never left the inside of Tom's house over there on Soul Street. Then from March 1996 until June 2000, Tanya was in total seclusion in Tom's house. She never left once 
which that is just absolutely insane to think about being locked inside a house for four straight years. Especially one where, and we'll get into this, but like, especially a house where only two people who live in said house can can know that you're there, you know, where it's very important that nobody else can know that you are here. So you basically, you have to become a ghost, you know? Yeah. Just yeah. really, really frightening. Yeah. You, you have to be like a little mouse, mm-hmm. you know, keep out of sight, make no noise, you know, versus even being taken to some other remote location where you're completely by yourself or, you know, by yourself with a captor. You're like with your captor and you're also having to keep quiet from his parents knowing that you're that. That's just like unheard of. Like right. it's crazy. So Tanya was mainly forced to stay in Justin's room at all times, except for when Tom wanted sex. Justin slept on the floor in a body-sized space next to the bed, and Tanya kept all of her things in a cardboard box. For most of the day, while Justin and Tom were at Cornell, Tanya stayed in the room. She wasn't allowed to leave for any reason, fearing she'd alert Tom's elderly parents, Bud and Eleanor. So obviously, if you can't leave a room, you can't go to the bathroom. So Tom's solution to that was to give Tanya a bucket to go to the bathroom in. She also said she was like, I'd have to go to the bathroom in the same bucket that I'd brush my teeth over, which is absolutely disgusting. And it's not like the bucket's being disposed of, you know what I mean, periodically throughout the day. No, it's just sitting there in the room. She's literally being treated like an animal, worse than an animal. Worse than an animal. It's so horrific. And throughout her entire captivity, Tanya was only given three buckets, a beige, a blue, and a red one. Three buckets over all these years. So like, what do you do with yourself for all this time? I mean, it was bad enough as a kid to be locked in your room for like fucking 30 minutes. You're like, all right, I'm ready to get out. But to be locked in a room for years. And terrified. Like, yeah, and absolutely terrified. I could, who knows what could happen to me. It's like, I mean, how do you, how do you even deal with that? Like, how do you deal with that anxiety and and just that not knowing what's going to happen next, you're scared. Yeah, you're scared to alert anyone to your location. Like, what can you even do? Well, Tanya actually said that she memorized which floorboards in the room creaked the loudest and avoided them, often just laying in the bed. So, Matt, you're just sitting there all day and you're like walking around this room. You're, and like the only thing you have to do is figure out which floorboards make the most noise so that you can avoid those. That's just, ugh, it's hard to wrap your mind around. She'd spend the days following the sun as it passed by her window. She'd read Goosebumps or Cat Fancy and only watch TV through headphones or at a low volume if Tom's parents were home. Bud and Eleanor were either unaware of her presence or were just willfully ignorant. Okay, which, can we talk about that for yeah, a Yeah, which... Mm, I'm calling bullshit yeah. that they had years and years and oh. just had no idea this person was living in their house. Right, because, you know, they did have full-on conversations with one another right. at certain points. Like, yes, Tanya had to keep her voice down for the most part, but there still would be times where she's talking with Tom or they're having sex. And, yeah. like, how can you just be sitting in the living room for, for you know, years and years and years and just be like, oh, yeah, there's not an extra person yeah. in the house? I don't know. My I only thought to that is I, I don't think we know – like the condition his parents were in, like, could they have been deaf or like, you know, hard of hearing? Could they, you know, like, what was their mobility like? You I know, know, when you get to like an elderly age, right. you can become kind of just like complacent, not really like, you know, clued into things. And like, cause like, for example, like I lived with my grandparents for a little while and they were, I think, in their like, like in their 70s. And they would just like not go in certain rooms. Like they would never go in my room. If I had my door shut, they would never go in my room. And they were kind of just like oblivious to like certain things like around the house. Like there would be things that I would notice like um, that was maybe dirty or something like that. And they would just like walk by it every single day. So you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to say like, could they have just been kind of like, you know, they're just kind of living day by day and like not really aware. But again, like, my grandparents' house is actually fairly big, and this seems like a pretty small house, yeah. and they're walking yeah. by this room like all the time. So I don't know. But I'm just thinking, like, could there could it be possible that they 
didn't know that she was there. I, I could believe that for like a s- certain amount of months, but yeah, years is uh, like like yeah. that's you're telling me there's not a single time where she would made a noise or whatever the fuck happened, and they weren't like, oh, what's that? Like, is someone else here or saw her? Like. And Justin didn't say anything to them? Right. Not Mm -hmm. once? Justin kept his mouth shut the entire time? That's hard to believe. Well, and I think, like, just on the, like, Bud, his father, like, he certainly had some pretty bad medical issues, for sure. And I think he had less of a range of motion um, when compared to Eleanor. But Eleanor, like, she would go into Tom's room. She would, she went around the house. I, I, I don't. She never smelled the bucket? Right. Right. That's what my other question was, was like, Okay, so when it was time to get rid of the bucket, even though it was only three in this whole time, like, yeah, this where was like what was he doing true. with this fucking bucket? Like, oh, sorry, I just have a bucket of feces. Like, I mean, I maybe he just like of. tossed it out his window. I yeah, can see him doing like, that. I don't know. It's just, but like that would fucking years. smell, right? You know, yeah, and like, of course, I'm sure they had some sense of smell still, so they weren't like, what the hell is going on in, t- you know, in his room? Right. I really think it's just that. Bud maybe truly didn't know because he he was in a much worse state. But Eleanor, I think, was just so scared of her son, so scared of Tom that like she yeah. was like, I'm not going to say anything. There's something going on, but I don't want to upset him. Yeah. I think that's the most likely yeah. situation. I mean, especially when, when you realize the types of threats Tom made. Yeah. Right. You he know? was a scary, scary dude. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you're probably wondering, what did Tanya eat? you know, over these years. And she mainly ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, or she'd have to smuggle leftovers from Tom's dinner. Once a week, he'd then sneak her down to the cellar in order to shower her. And of course, as we've already mentioned, there was definitely sex and Tom demanded sex daily from Tanya and even had her record each experience in a calendar book. She color coded each day, depending on their activity so that he could remember and then go and gloat to his friends and coworkers. Again, co-workers that he worked with at the same school Tanya attended, which is absolutely insane. And if he was really fucking doing this, why did none of these co-workers go to the authorities? Maybe he was also threatening them, like, if you but say it's anything, like, I'll kill you. But I mean, That's yeah. insane. Like, I, yeah, come no, on. I agree. Like, I think that's ridiculous. So what are they? They have literally a bunch of pedophiles yeah. working security at Cornell Middle School, it seems like. Because unless he's like, I don't, is he saying it's Tanya, or is he just saying it's a girl? Regardless, it, why it, yeah. you shouldn't be working there if you have anyone you're holding captive and abusing. Well, and like that's the th- I think I it, at this point he was not using her name. Later right. on, he would use her alias, but um, they knew he had a girlfriend. But like, come on, guys, you couldn't put two and two together when he beforehand was spending like an absurd amount of time with her in the hallways. Already spreading this rumor that she had like said that he tried to molest her. Yeah. And then all of a sudden she's missing. She's missing. Yeah. yeah. You talk seriously. About how having... dumb are you if yeah, you don't dude. realize that and make that connection? Uh, that's the that's probably one of the most mind boggling things about this case is how the hell did nobody make this connection of Tanya and Tom? Right. It seems like. I mean, maybe they did and just a bunch of people are willfully ignorant. You know what I mean? Is it possible one of them did and the cops were like, well, Oh, she just ran away. What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. This whole thing is just really hard to believe is like true at times. You're like, how the fuck did this happen? This just seems so insane. How did nobody figure this out? How did the cops not figure this out? And it's it's solely because like they... They just wrote her off. They wrote her That's off as a runaway insane. from so that early That is on. so, yeah. such gross negligence on their part. It's, it's, that in itself is a crime to like write off Absolutely. a runaway just because you've had multiple reports that she's run away. They're like, ah, you know, and again, like there's a lot of examples of that happening. It does happen quite a bit where cops are like, ah, oh, we've chased her down so many times and she just turns up. So. And then, of course, the one time she actually disappears, they don't do anything. Ah, yeah, it's pretty frustrating. So at first, Tanya felt like, you know, these sexual encounters with Tom were just necessary sacrifices made out of, you know, this love for Tom. And he told her that he alone saved her life. And she initially believed him on this. But still, this experience took a massive toll on her. 
She developed anorexia in her first year living with Tom and only weighed 93 pounds at this point. She then developed psoriasis that went completely untreated, which resulted in permanent scarring. She suffered constant headaches, chest pains, and toothaches because she's not going to the doctor. She's not going to the dentist. She's not getting any sort of preventative care. And Tom always just told her to just, quote, deal with it. (laughs) Just evil, man. In 1996, Tanya contracted lice, and when she told Tom, this is what he said. He said, if Justin or I get lice, you're as good as dead, and then threaten to dump her body in the river. Which is like, what? Like th- That statement to me just shows how fucking unhinged this guy is, and how you know, utterly evil he is. He has no regard for, for human life. He's making these types of threats all the time, and she's just a piece of property to him at this point. Of course, at this point, she could only have gotten the lice from him or Justin because she hadn't seen any other person in months. So it's like, how are you going to blame her when you were probably the one that gave it to her or your fucking son did? Unreal. This statement terrified Tanya so much that she wrote a last will and testament. That's heartbreaking itself to be this young in this situation, you're literally sitting there writing your last will and testament because you're like, I could be, be, be killed at any point in time. Like he could just decide this is over and, and that's it. And this was honestly a, a smart thing to do, in my opinion. You know, she wrote down her name, the names of her parents and where she was from so that if Tom did in fact kill her, people would know who she was. And then she folded up that piece of paper that she wrote all this on and then stashed it underneath the carpet in Tom's bedroom. And it would actually remain there for the entirety of her captivity. Then in October 1996, she decided to leave for the first time. She gathered her belongings and told Tom after he returned home from work. And he pointed at her face and said, quote, if you try to leave me, I will kill you. And again, this wasn't the first time that he threatened to kill someone. He retained custody of Justin because he told his ex-wife that he would kill her if she tried to fight for custody. And he often told Tanya how he planned to kill his ex-wife and even her new boyfriend one day. So murder's on the on the mind for him for sure. And like this this will be something to remember later on because it is it is very possible that he did in fact murder somebody. He'd also convinced Tanya that her parents didn't care about her, that they never even looked for her. And this would obviously make anybody feel completely helpless if somebody's telling you, yeah, you're you're missing and your parents aren't even out there looking for you. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to tell, like based on what Jerry has said, Jerry did say he would go out and look for her quite often. He would drive around and, and, you know, try to look for her, um, to see if, you know, run across her on the street or something. Cause at this, again, at this point, Jerry has no idea where she is. She could just be out there somewhere, you know, on the street, even homeless. Um, so that was definitely not the truth, but of course Tom's going to tell her that, right? Then Tom gave Tanya pink eye and only gave her Visine to treat it, which as we know, I believe that's a bacterial infection or is it a viral infection? It's bacterial. It's bacterial, right? That needs medication. You need antibiotics. You need some type of um, medication to clear that up. But as you can imagine, Tom definitely did not get anything to help her with pink eye. In fact, the infection got so bad that she couldn't open her eyes for weeks until the infection just cleared up on its own. Which that would just be so, I mean, the agony to not be able to see and you have this infection and, and knowing that this could be cleared up with some medication and right. he's just like, nope, deal with it. And when she got the flu or other worse illnesses, Tom forced her to stay in the closet and vomit into her waste bucket because he was afraid that her noises would alert his parents, which is like, I don't know, man. I think the more the the further we get into this, the more it seems likely that his parents had to have known. Yeah. There's somebody vomiting in your room. Yeah, wouldn't this smell be so terrible that it's right. traveling yeah. out of the room by now? Even with the door right. closed, like you you would think you'd walk by and be like, "Oh my god, what's going on in there?" This house doesn't even have air conditioning. Right. Like, it's stagnant air. Yeah. In this house. So that's my thing too, is like the smell has just got to be horrendous. Yeah. And she's stuck in the room Yeah, with the bucket. The only form of air conditioning that she had in her room was a box fan. 
And still this room would heat up to nearly 100 degrees. So that it's like a hundred degree or even 90 plus degrees in a room, you know, bodily fluids in the bucket. Those two are going to create a horrific smell. No, I just don't believe there's a way in which like they didn't smell that. Right. Like even if you like people who have pets know that if you're, if your dog like, yeah, like, poops inside or throws up or something like you can smell it or you know like oh something's going on and you can usually smell it even outside of the room so i just can't be- i can't imagine in a way in which they had no idea when this poor woman this when this poor girl is literally going to the bathroom and throwing up in this same bucket continuously not to mention she's only able to shower for one week so her personal hygiene is probably terrible i'm sure she's not able to brush her teeth on a regular basis, you know, wash her body. It's just horrific. And if it's 100 degrees, you're just sweating. Right. Yeah. That This is literally hell. Yeah. Like, I can't imagine much worse conditions to live in than this. Well, and like, you're living in a sauna, you're living in an yeah. oven, you're using the restroom in a bucket, you're smelling that constantly. I wouldn't want to brush my teeth, frankly, yeah. if that's what I'm spitting into. And yeah. on top of that, you're only eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches like do you really like i just can't imagine where my head would even be at you know like what how i could possibly think clearly in that condition i don't i really probably think you can't like you're just i mean i think you just kind of go into survival mode you're just like it's that fight or flight you just gotta you know you're just trying to keep yourself alive at that point Oh, it's just absolutely terrible. And then coupled out with the fact you got an absolute psychopath, you know, guy who's threatening to kill you, who's, you know, sexually assaulting you on the daily. And, and you know, he's coming back, right? You know, he's coming back every time he leaves, you know, he's coming back. And so it's just is this vicious cycle. And despite all of this, Tanya was conflicted. Her lack of nutrition, treatment, and inability to leave the room left her with as you can imagine, a pretty bad mental space. She was convinced that Tom was the only person who cared about her, and if she tried to escape, she'd either be homeless or be killed by him. And I think that just that statement alone, you hear, she was convinced that Tom was the only person that cared about her, yet Tom is also threatening to kill her. So it's like, how do those two really make sense? But I think you have to think about being in this situation. Like there is no room to have rational thoughts or like connect dots or anything. You're just like literally just trying to survive. Right. So, and I think, you know, what's crazy and we'll get into this later, but people literally come after Tanya and think she made this stuff up and are like, why didn't you just leave? You know, he left you every day. So why don't you just get up and walk out of the house and this all be over. When he's literally saying no one gives a fuck about you and if you leave, I'll kill you. And you expect her to just be like, mm, oh, I'm just going to leave. He's, he has manipulated her into thinking that he is the only person that gives a shit about her and that she is in the best place possible because she's with him. I just don't understand how people can have that mindset of like, right. why didn't you just leave? Well, this is a... a- perfect example of stockholm syndrome yeah right which if you're not familiar it's a proposed condition or theory that tries to explain why hostages sometimes develop a psychological bond with their captors and you know it's 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 definitely something that i think the average person doesn't really understand and you know even when you you know you hear like okay there's something to you know kind of equate this situation to with you know stockholm syndrome but it's like it's still very complicated and and hard to understand right unless you've actually been through it so stockholm syndrome isn't a formal diagnosis but people you know there's symptoms um that people have in common who who you know i I guess what do you say are class classified like this isn't a diagnosis you wouldn't classify someone as someone as having this but it's just a like proposed condition or like theory essentially. So during her captivity, she had also been getting close with Justin, Tom's son, and despite her strange relationship with his father, Tanya initially liked having someone close to her in age 
to hang out with, which, cause I mean, of course you would, <laughs> it's the only, you know, it's the only normalcy you're experiencing. And even that's a bit of a stretch. I'd say like, you know, here's his son who, as we'll find out, not much better than him. So of course, Justin hated Tanya for those first few months. And for one, he was jealous of the attention that his father was giving her. And he also disliked the fact that he had to sleep on the floor in his own bedroom. Soon, however, they enjoyed each other's company while Justin was still young. Tanya wanted to know more about his interest in meteorology, and the two spent, you know, many days together playing PlayStation. Plus, when Justin was home, Tanya didn't have to use headphones, but she still had to keep her voice down because obviously, like, he could be watching TV so she could watch it with him, and nobody would know that she was there. Tom described Tanya and Justin as quote unquote brother and sister which makes this even more disturbing. This, of course, was not the truth. As Justin grew older, he took after his father in more ways than one. He would not speak about the abuse he witnessed inflicted on Tanya and would not respond when she spoke poorly of Tom. He also hated his mother, Tom's ex-wife, and once Tanya heard Justin talk to his father about running into his mom on the street, and Justin said, quote, that slut came up to talk to me and I said, fuck you, bitch, and walked away. And when he said this, Tom just laughed and said, quote, that's my boy. Oh my God. As Justin entered his teenage years, he harassed Tanya too. He would wrestle with her in order to fondle her. And on more than one occasion, he asked her for sex. So he's just learning this behavior from his father. Tanya would always threaten to tell Tom if Justin tried anything, and this would usually shut him down. As Tanya entered into her second year of her captivity, she developed OCD. This routine she was in was really starting to get to her, and the only time she could leave the bedroom were for sex with Tom, those rush midnight showers in the cellar, or the third Thursday of every month when Bud and Eleanor were at senior meetings. It was only then that Tanya could roam the house freely and take a bath. All she wanted for her 16th birthday was a warm bath, however it did not fall on one of those Thursdays, so instead Tom just gave her a chocolate eclair. Tanya spent those first four Christmases at the hose house hidden inside Tom's bedroom closet, and she'd have to listen to all the festivities going on on Christmas Day through the vents, but you can't imagine how lonely that must have felt. And it was during this time that Tanya began praying for love and salvation. And as the days blended together, Tanya forgot what had occurred during those first five years of isolation. Once her mother, Sherry, even called the hose residents, confused about the call that Tanya had placed during one of her runaway attempts. Tanya thought that Tom was only keeping her out of love and protection, and that he'd actually let her go if her parents showed that they still cared about her. After the call was placed, Tanya excitedly talked to Tom, saying that she was happy that her parents were still looking for her. And this is what Tom told her. He said the only reason she called is because she's upset about the cost of the phone call. Which, how does that make any damn sense? She doesn't give a damn about you. So again, just reinforcing that, like, oh, just because she called... Yeah, it's not because she cares about you. It's about the cost of that phone call. <laughs> well, you you hear this and you hear this from Tom and she's like, uh, okay. I mean, just imagine how crushing that must have been too, to, to hear him say that to her. You know, she's finally has a little glimmer of hope and he's like, nope, she doesn't give a damn about you. He's got to keep that power over her and that control. Yep. And in reality, Sherry had reported the call to the police and said, Tom seems suspicious. So she gives the police this massive tip. But given Sherry's, you know, past mental health issues and her history, the police are like, yeah, whatever, crazy woman. We're not going to follow up with this tip. And they do nothing with it, uh, which is such a shame. In 1996, someone called the house and told Eleanor that Tanya was being hidden in her home and that they would be calling the police. And when the police arrived that night, or the next, Tom's mother was not home, so Tom actually went out and met the officer on the porch. But, you know, you're like, just, all right, we're 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 right there. The police are at the door. Before he met the cops out front, Tom led Tanya to the basement and told her to get inside a cardboard box if they entered the house. The officer then told Tom about the tip they had received and asked if they could search the home. Tom said he had no problem with the search, however, he was worried the cops might wake up his elderly parents. And guess what? The officers are like, definitely don't want to do that. Don't want to disturb the elderly parents. We got this really great tip, but you know what? You don't want to wake up your parents. Sorry for the inconvenience. And they left. 
And then guess what? Tom calls the station back later and lets them know like, hey, you guys can come back and search the house. And guess what? The police declined their request out of respect for his parents. That is insane. I don't even know what else yeah. to say. Yeah, it's, it's just like, like absolutely fucking baffling. No, it's literally, ba- I'm like speechless. They're like, no, nah, it's okay. And it's very clear they have not figured out the connection whatsoever. Oh, no. They're just looking at this like, like this is a wild tip from a wild lady and probably not true. And uh, again, they at this point, you know, we again, Tanya cannot remember really when this took place because the years just totally blended together. But it's at least several months or even years after she already went missing. So the cops are kind of just like. They don't. They're like, why are we here? Basically, right. you know, they're like, she ran away all those years ago. They're not even really like taking it seriously in the first place. Yeah, that's a that's a good good point. So after this experience, Tanya once again asked Tom if her parents were looking for her, and Tom said, "That's just some old bitty in the neighborhood being a neb shit. No idea what that even means. That's some like Pennsylvania I slang. Yeah, I, I had to look up neb shit. Uh, it basically just means like a nosy person. Ah, uh, you know." After the run-in with the cops, Tom's psychological abuse of Tanya only grew worse. He told her, you're just a pretty face. You'll never make it on your own. You were put on this earth to take care of me and me to take care of you. He always reminded her that he, quote, trained her for sex and that I trained you, you are my property. So he's just, you know, this is just the grooming continues, you know. When Jerry and Joanne bought a new home in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania, Tom showed Tanya the newspaper that had published the sale and said, hey, look at this. See, they've moved on. It's as if you never mattered to them just because they bought a new home. Like, how manipulative is that? It's crazy. In 1997, Tom showed her another article about Sherry's marriage to Craig, and Tanya was devastated. And that's when she really started feeling like her parents did, in fact, move on with their life. Tanya once again told Tom she needed to leave after her 16th birthday, and he told her he had saved her life and she'd ruin his if she left. And instead of threatening to kill her, this is when Tom begins threatening to kill himself, saying, quote, If you leave me, Tanya, I'll kill myself. I can't live without you. Just, and and the, the audacity for people to be like, why don't you just get up and leave and walk out? After she's been held captive by this guy for years, who's been, you know, manipulating her and grooming her. Like, it's unbelievable. Because now, now not only does she have the fear, he might kill me, but he could kill himself too. And again, this, this goes back to Stockholm Syndrome, you know, and, and looking at the symptoms. Well, and she's that. starting to believe like, oh, I mean, a lot of people in these abusive relationships start to believe like, okay, maybe I deserve this or I'm, this is supposed to happen to me. Like, I did something that, made this happen it's my fault to some degree and also now she's feeling guilty because he's like you don't understand if i don't if i can't have you then i'm not going to be on this planet i'll just you know end my life and you know that's adds a whole other layer of complexity and guilt that she's feeling it's horrible i mean at this point you got to remember this is somebody that she cares about and she's gone through all this for this person so to add to now like I'm res- potentially responsible for his life. Yeah. It just escalates things to a whole nother level. Well, and I feel like even though obviously things are absolutely horrible at this point, she's also clinging on to the memory of like having no privacy at home exactly. and him being her one, like she said, refuge from the turmoil, you know? So to her, like, again, she's just so malnourished and not thinking clearly. Of course, in her head, I think at this point, caring for her equals not killing her or not killing himself. Like, it's just, you you can't really relate if you are saying to her, like, why don't you just leave? Because then you can't understand what her thought process could possibly have been. Yeah, no, so true. And And just like, can we like give Tanya some kudos for just like making it this far? And yeah. like, like, my God incredible strength and none of us can even remotely imagine what this would be like and yet she's just going through this day in day out the years are blending together she's living in absolutely horrific conditions she's being she's being horrifically abused and she's just 
you know, she's continually keeping, you know, this glimmer, you know, this little bit of hope that maybe I'll, maybe I'll get out of here, you know, by bringing up like, can I leave after my 16th birthday and things like that. So that tells me like she, in her mind, what's potentially keeping her going is like, I will get out of this situation in some way one day. And to just be able to keep that, that strength going for so long is, you know, I don't think, I don't think everybody could do that. I really don't. It's, it's, it's so impressive considering all things. On top of all of this, Tom began saying strange things about two girls who had been abducted and killed in recent years, and both were students at Cornell. The first girl was 14-year-old Anna Marie Callahan, and she was found dead on the banks of the Monongahela River in 1995, and she had blonde hair and actually looked a lot like Tanya. Then in June of 1998, 14-year-old Kimberly Krim went missing. Now, if you remember, you know, Tanya was friends with Monica Krim. Kimberly was the younger sister of Monica. And Kimberly was also blonde, went to Cornell, and she went missing at the same age Tom abducted Tanya. And sadly, her body was found decomposed months later in a cemetery. And this is just so creepy to me. And uh, there's got to be something here. But her body was found decomposed in that cemetery, visible from Tom's house on Soul Street. He could literally look down and see, see this area. And when Tom was told she was found dead, he wasn't surprised at all. In fact, he said, you knew what was coming. Like, What does that even mean? Tom had vented to Tanya and coworkers about how much he hated Kimberly and Monica Krim. So to me, that sounds like a motive. And once while drunk, Tom even described the configuration of Kimberly's dead body in the cemetery, even though the information hadn't even been made public yet. He told Tanya that Kimberly was propped up against a hillside among overgrown grass and shrubbery. He said that she was slumped over her knees, bent inwards against her chest, and he said that her underwear had been pulled down to her ankles. However, the manner or time of Kimberly Krim's death could not be determined due to the state of composition her body was found in. Tom later stated that he knew that information because a cop told him and he had nothing to do with either of the girl's deaths. Many years later, though, an inmate claimed that Tom confessed to both murders. Tanya later stated that she had never seen Tom wearing bloodied or dirty clothes, but like that doesn't really prove anything because he could have easily changed or showered. And again, Tanya was locked up in Justin's bedroom 24-7. So it'd be, I mean, how is she supposed to know? She's literally locked up in his house. And what's sad is that both of these murders are still cold to this day. But Kimberly's death indicated that people were still looking for Tanya. In a newspaper article about her death, Tanya saw that her name had been registered with the National Database for Missing Children. Uh, Yeah, the National Center for Missing Exploited Children actually did an age-progress photo of her and definitely aided in the efforts to help finding her. Um, And when, you know, she found this, Tanya excitedly showed this to Tom who once again shot down her hopes of escaping, saying, all it means is that you're just another number in some database. After all, no one ever finds a milk carton kid. Because, you know, they they went ahead and put her picture, you know, her missing uh, poster out there on the milk cartons, if you remember back when they did that. Um, and Tom just completely dismisses that. You know, all After all, no one ever finds a milk carton kid. Just crushing every bit of hope. Um, you know, which the, this just whole exchange is so bizarre to me. You know, here she is excited about the fact that people are looking for her, and, and the person she's going to tell this to is literally the person holding her captive. I mean, that just shows how fucked up this dynamic and relationship really is and how twisted it is. But at this point, Tanya is just getting absolutely sick of being locked in the bedroom all the time and really couldn't do it any longer. Tom had in fact promised that they would move into an apartment together so Tanya could live more freely, and Tom even made a point of reading listings in front of her. However, he always gave an excuse. According to Tanya, the apartments were, quote, too cheap, too expensive, too rich, too poor, and always too dangerous. Tom was always scared that someone might see Tanya in public if he gave her more freedom, and that they could trace her back to him. Judy Sokol, if you remember her from earlier, she showed up at the Soul Street residence in October 1998. Tanya wanted to speak with her, but Tom told her to stay inside. When he returned, Tom said that Judy asked if she was still living with him, and Tom said, I said you were long gone, said I didn't have a clue where you were. While it might seem like Judy was looking out for Tanya here, the police questioned her in the first few years of Tanya's disappearance, and 
Again, you have to remember she fully protected Tom from further investigation because it could have been very easy for Judy to give up Tom and this all be over all these years, like years ago, right? right? She is the only other adult who knows exactly what's happening. So she she's absolutely culpable in this. Tanya had quit smoking cigarettes in 1996 and stayed tobacco free for seven years. And Tom would still try to get her to drink and smoke weed with him, but she often declined. She rolled Tom 20 joints every Friday night and would only have one or two drinks with him. Overall, though, as the years wore on and Tom grew meaner and more controlling of Tanya, she preferred it when he was drunk. At least then, it seemed like he was a little bit happier. Tanya's 18th birthday rolled around in 2000 and marked the beginning of her third phase of captivity. This is when she started to enjoy sparse, secret, and welcomed outings into the world. When Bud and Eleanor were in Atlantic City on vacation, Tanya asked Tom if she could go out and buy new clothes. As she had only worn her clothes from middle school and Tom's hand-me-downs, since, you know, captivity began, which is absolutely crazy to think about. Tom said they could make this work, and Tanya left the house for the first time since February 1996. Tom gave her $120 and precise directions on bus routes to AIM store in Olympia Shopping Center. Tom said that no one would recognize her since it had been four years since her disappearance, and missing posters had, for the most part, been taken down by this point. Tanya left through the back door into the alley so Tom could keep lookout and hopefully no neighbor would see this strange young girl exiting his home. However, when Tanya got on the bus, she felt no inclination to escape. She still thought if she left for good, she'd be homeless, killed, or that Tom would commit suicide or even be thrown in jail. When Tanya was finally done checking out, she was shocked that the cashier could simply scan barcodes to ring her up instead of manually typing in the prices into the POS system. I mean, that's that must have been pretty wild for yeah. her. They can scan this thing and, and it just puts just the prices in. Be so depressing too to realize, like, wow, I really have missed so much of my totally. life. Like, that's just such a small thing that most people don't even think about happening. And to her, it's like, oh my god, you can literally scan something now. And I just can't imagine the thoughts of like, wow, how far has society changed, and what are all the things that I never got to experience and may may never get to experience. Yeah, and you think it could be a little scary too? Oh, yeah. You're like, whoa, like the totally. world's so different than yep. it was four years ago. Yeah. You know, and like when you've been in captivity for so long, you're almost relieved when you return to it. You know, you get these outings in the world and it's not like instantaneously you forget everything that has happened to you these past yeah. four years and you're like, oh, the world's great. Yeah. What am I doing? It's not like you, you know, you just all of a sudden shed that, that old life and immediately come out of it. No, you're like, oh, this is kind of scary. I'm sure just being out in public, being around other people, the social anxiety you would have. Totally. Like, even just like talking to the store clerk and be like checking out and they're like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, in the back of your mind, you have all of these thoughts and feelings like, I can't say anything. I can't reveal who I am. I can't, yep. you know, all of these fears are coming in. You're just like, you know, deer in headlights, just like silent. I can imagine she probably was super awkward. On those, especially those first couple of outings, right? So it was kind of a relief for her to return back to that bedroom with the door locked behind her. Again, it had been her life for the past four years. It really was her whole world at this point. But still, the boredom and the sameness after a trip to the shopping mall reminded her that the anxiety of getting outside was definitely well worth it. She told Tom that while she was no longer planning on escaping, he needed to figure out how to improve her situation. Tom contacted a lawyer to figure out what their next steps would be. And apparently the lawyer said, wow, you could turn this into a movie. What did he tell the lawyer exactly? Yeah, I'm so confused on that part. Like, like did he say, yeah, this girl was 14 when yeah. she showed up my house and she's been living there ever since. See, I also think that this is all coming from Tom to Tanya. Um, I think there is a possibility that he actually didn't speak to a lawyer and he just said that he did so that way it would, it would calm tanya a little bit yeah it, that quote seems awfully a lot like something tom would say right. if you ask me but apparently the lawyer told tom that since tanya was 18 guess what the best thing to do at this point is oh yeah marry her and then move out of the state i just don't see a lawyer saying these things like Especially Actively. if they, especially if they know anything about this situation, right? But to marry her and move out of the state was basically impossible for Tom, since he was broke as fuck and he didn't want to leave behind this house, you know, on Soul Street, where his parents were letting him live rent free 
you know, in his forties at this point. Well, at this point, uh, they actually started making him pay one hundred dollars. Right, hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. Woo, hundred <laughs> yeah. bucks, dude. Like that's crazy. And he's working. He's still working full time. And you know, what's he doing? What's the rest of the dough going towards? I have no idea. But then in September of 2000, she was given another $120 to go shopping again. And Tom began allowing Tanya to leave her bedroom at night once his parents slept. So she got to start sitting out on the back porch at night and fed the stray cats of the neighborhood. And Tanya was allowed to leave the house again in September to buy something for Justin's 17th birthday. And that's when she went to JJ's convenience store, which was owned by Joe Sparico. For the next five years, Tanya was allowed to leave the house once or twice a year to shop at one of the various stores. And she mainly went to JJ since it was close by. And Joe had really become sort of a father figure to her. He was Tom's neighbor and she would watch him interact with his family from her bedroom window. He was expressive, Italian, and protective of his family. She liked that he would give free food to customers experiencing hard times and he made her think of her own father, who she started to miss. But still, she could not imagine escaping. Survival at this point was linked to Tom in her mind and she didn't have any indication that her parents would take her back even if she did return. Tom's father, Bud, became more and more ill after the year 2000, and his medical expenses started to strangle the household income. But this still came with a slight benefit. Since the family wasn't doing much for Christmas that year, Tanya was allowed to stay in Tom's bedroom with the door locked instead of hidden inside of his closet. The small difference profoundly affected Tanya, and she actually wrote, This slight deviation that allowed me out of the closet on Christmas Eve 2000 was as astonishing as it was baffling. How could I be unworthy of such a thing for so many years? How could I be so grateful for being as worthy as anyone would be free of such confinement? Confounded and confused, I suffered on with Tom Hose exercising complete control over my life. That puts things into perspective, man. Soon, Tanya could not hide her growing need to escape by the following year. She begged Tom to meet with the lawyer again, but she started to see him for what he was. And she wrote, how could he transform from a captor to Prince Charming for him to be able to set me free without going to jail for keeping me captive? And Tom claimed to have met with the lawyer again, who said he was surprised they were still together. The lawyer had grown tired of their situation and added no new information He just said, get married, move out of the state, or go to jail, Tom. To have some control over her life, Tanya started smoking cigarettes again in 2003, and instead of buying them on her rare trips to JJ's, she smoked the butts left behind by Tom in the bedroom's ashtray. The day seriously blended for the next several years, and Tanya's memory is very hazy from this point forward, but what she remembers most were Tom's pathetic attempts to make her happy. He mainly ordered her products off the Avon catalog from a Cornell teacher where Everyone knew he had a girlfriend. On November 4th, 2004, Tom asked Tanya to marry him. On Christmas, he gave her a card with a proposal written in it, and she wrote yes on the card and returned it to him. What's strange is that Tanya said she would have married him in 2004, and, you know, at this point, he still had her brainwashed. But guess what? That marriage never came. He promised her trips to the jewelry store or gave excuses that he couldn't find the perfect ring. But Tanya had been out in the world more and more at this point. And she was starting to witness genuine relationships and started realizing how truly strange her situation with Tom was. She actually wrote, At 22 years old, after years of psychological torture and sexual degradation, I was in fact prepared to marry Tom Hose. Thankfully, that would change. After Justin graduated from high school, he started working the night shift at Walmart, which meant he would sleep in the bedroom all day and Tanya had to be more silent than usual. On top of that, Bud's condition worsened and he and Eleanor barely left the house, which meant that Tanya was further relegated to the bedroom. So basically like extra trapped, you know. After the proposal, Tom showed complete apathy towards Tanya. He complained about her waist bucket and made her cover it with one of her t-shirts. He also routinely forgot to leave her toilet paper. So in order to wipe, she had to use notebook paper, which that just is painful. I can imagine using paper. It was around this time that Tanya didn't think about escaping, but rather taking her own life. However, her belief in God would not allow her. Instead, she started praying for him, saying, quote, take me and end my miserable existence. Tanya began to complain loudly to Tom about her issues and to avoid his parents finding out They devised a plan. They came up with a fake name she could assume. 
and this name was Nikki Diane Allen. Nikki was from her middle name, Nicole. Diane came from her mom's middle name. Tanya asked Tom if these names would be all right, and he responded with, nobody cares about your middle name, Tanya. Nobody cares, period. The last name Allen came from a random name Tanya pointed to in the phone book. A few weeks after this, Bud was hospitalized following a broken blood vessel, and Tom told his parents that his girlfriend, Nikki, would regularly come by the house to care for him. And this is all considering like, oh, they don't know who this girl is. And Tanya knew that his parents wouldn't question this because, again, he had complete control over them. They were afraid of him. There was one instance that really uh, proves that, that statement. Once Eleanor found weed in Tom's room and she confiscated it, he told her that he was going to go on a walk. And when he returned, that weed better be back where she found it or else he would, quote, burn this fucking house down. Which, oh my God, it's just, it's just insane. Tanya waited in the living room for Tom and his parents to return from the hospital, and she felt incredibly anxious and strange. She was being introduced to people she had only heard through the vents for nine years, and her pacing got so bad that Justin told her, quote, to sit the fuck down. The meeting itself was completely unremarkable. Bud and Eleanor were polite, and Tanya walked back to Justin's bedroom as if she had never been there. That whole thing is just so bizarre. And again, we're just going off of, uh, you know, basically taking their word for it. But like the fact that they reacted the way that they did, it makes me think that they knew what the fuck was going on and who she was actually. I I kind of agree with you because like the way Tanya described it in the book, it was very much just like a, oh, nice to meet you. Like not even asking like, how did you meet my son or whatever? Just kind of like. Basically asked for her name, and then they're like, okay, sounds good, and and moved on, you know. All right, back to the room. Right. What? Yeah, I don't know. None of that makes any sense to me. But Tanya's final phase of captivity began on June 17, 2005, after she assumed her new alias. Tom still tightly controlled Tanya's life, but she was exposed to a whole new world through Eleanor. At first, her relationship was pleasant, but it quickly soured as Eleanor disapproved of her relationship with Tom. To her, Tanya wasn't a homemaker, and she hated that her now nearly 50-year-old son was dating a 23-year-old. Tanya grew fond of Bud, though, who was kind to her. Unlike Tom, he was genuinely a nice man, and she appreciated how much love he had for Eleanor. This only further helped Tanya realize how bizarre her relationship with Tom was. Then there was one extremely hot day in July 2005 when Tanya left the house after she had fought with Eleanor. And Tom told Tanya to take a walk around the neighborhood while he spoke to his mother. And that's when Tanya came across a Methodist church thrift store, which she entered to cool off. The lady behind the counter started talking to her, and Tanya apologized for her short shorts. The woman said it didn't matter and introduced herself as Jennifer. Tanya returned frequently over the next four weeks, and the two spoke often about their faith. Eventually, Jennifer asked if Tanya wanted to help out daily. So Tanya helped at the thrift store, attended church services, and participated in Bible study even. However, Tom hated the fact that she was attending a Methodist church instead of a Catholic one because you, you, can, you know Tom's amazing, you know, amazing Catholic. Like, what the f- Like, no, that's just him being like, I don't want you to go to church, basically. But eventually he stopped fighting, fearing that she'd reveal the truth to her church. He even arranged for Joyce Brown, the secretary of Cornell, who had worked there while Tanya attended, to drive her to services. Joyce claims to have not have recognized Tanya, which, I mean, a lot of time has passed here, so it'd be very easy not to recognize the 14-year-old that you knew all those years ago. Tom scolded Tanya for her relationship with his mother and even stopped giving her an allowance at one point, and Tanya, who is now allowed to leave the house while Tom was at work, complained to Joe Sparico about this. Joe offered Tanya a job at JJ's. And it's reported elsewhere that Tanya took up a part-time job with Joe, but according to her memoir, she could not have a legitimate job because she did not know her own social security number. But this made Joe very suspicious of her situation because you're like, what do you mean you don't know your social security number? You're 23, you don't know your social security number? It's kind of weird. You you should be a working adult. And she's like, I don't know. Tanya also considered running numbers for an illegal bookie operation that Tom and Eleanor frequented. Tanya had also become friends with the woman who ran the system and would spend many days hanging out with her as she worked across the street from the Ho's residence. And although Tanya now enjoyed more freedom in the outside world, Tom controlled her tightly. 
She had to be back home by 3.30 when Tom would get home from work and had to spend the day caring for Bud or doing whatever Tom wanted. Again, she was seeing genuine relationships out in the real world, and this was very eye-opening for Tanya. Specifically, Joe and his wife made Tanya angry about the life she was forced into with Tom. She saw what a real marriage and real love was supposed to mean. Not her life in captivity and the control that Tom had forced onto her for almost 10 years. But again, Tom's brainwashing was looming over her head whenever Tanya thought about escaping. She feared for her life, for her safety, and didn't know if anyone was even looking for her. But Tanya knew that if she wanted to escape, she had to do it with a clear mind. She hid her anger and chose to spend one more Christmas with the Hose family before escaping. She baked cookies and hid them in decorative tins to give to her friends at the church and Joe's family. She spent most of Christmas Day with Margie, the bookie, and Tom called her and demanded that she return home for dinner. Later, Tom's family went to their Catholic church for mass and Tanya went to the Methodist church and she could really feel like their lives were beginning to separate. A few weeks later, while hanging out at JJ's, Tanya noticed a middle-aged man staring at her. At first, she was creeped out, but later she recognized him as the juvenile lieutenant who had brought her back to her father's house numerous times after runaway attempts. He had even been assigned to her case when she initially went missing, so the two definitely knew each other, at least recognized each other. And once he did recognize her, the man returned his food to the shelf and left immediately. Tanya, once again wishing that Tom actually did want the best for her, excitedly told him about the exchange that night, hopeful that people were still looking for her. And Tom shot back, probably just some perverted old man staring at a pretty young girl. Wanting to build up the courage to escape, Tanya began reading horoscopes to find direction. On the day she considered telling Joe about her true identity, this is what her horoscope read. You will be thinking big thoughts and getting more firmly in touch with your own destiny. Decisions come swiftly. And Tom's horoscope read, You're very likely going to discover what you are made of and how you compare, favorably or unfavorably, to the competition. And Joe's read, You're spending too much energy safeguarding your reputation. Trust in those around you. They will give you your due. Tanya saw these as the final confirmation that you know what? It's time to tell Joe the truth about what's really going on because she really felt like all of these horoscopes related to one another. So on March 21st, 2006, Tanya went down to JJ's intending to tell Joe Sparico the truth, but still she was very antsy and nervous and just spent a few hours pacing at the front. Joe was fed up with her loitering and her refusing to accept help or a job from him and asked why she wouldn't just leave Tom like someone would leave a normal relationship. Tanya went straight to the back to play on the illegal poker machines Joe kept hidden there. He periodically went back to check on her in between customers and eventually he sat down next to Tanya and said, quote, something's not right here. And that was it. That's just all it took. And Tanya started crying. Joe asked why she was crying and said that he cared for her like his own daughter. And Tanya said, quote, I'm not who you think I am. I did a horrible thing. I screwed up my life horribly. Joe asked if she had killed or robbed somebody because, I mean, that's kind of what you would assume from that statement. And after she said no, Tanya finally told him the truth. Joe listened patiently and then said, quote, don't do anything out of the ordinary. I'll take care of everything. You need to go back there to the house one more time. Don't let on what's happening. Just act normal until police get there. Finally, Joe told Tanya to call him later and she left JJ's. That's when Joe confirmed her missing status with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and then called the McKeesport police who told him to call back the next day as they were too busy. Yeah, dude, that part really... What the hell, that, dude? Like, literally, you have a guy saying, yeah, this girl who's been missing for 10 years, I know where she is, and uh, you need to arrest the man who's keeping her captive. And they're like, yeah, we'll try to get to it tomorrow, man. Like, we got a busy day ahead of it. Like, she can spend f- one more night there. It's yeah. no big deal. What the fuck? Like, oh, man. So Joe called his son, Sean, a former McKeesport officer, and he used his contacts to get the police to move. Tanny returned to the Hose residence as if nothing happened. Tom was busy reading the newspaper in his room and his parents were watching TV. Tanya used this lull to call Joe. He told her that the police had entered JJ's and that she should remain calm. Tanya hung up just as Tom entered the kitchen to get more iced tea. And he said, what you doing, kitty? Tanya didn't respond and she just stared at the knife drawer. Tom returned upstairs and Tanya called Joe again who told her the police were coming. When Tanya hung up this time, Eleanor came in and asked if Tanya would make pancakes tonight. To which Tanya said, 
fuck no. No, she said she wouldn't make pancakes, but I can imagine in her head she'd be like, no, I'm fucking out of here. Eleanor said, quote, but you're still going to eat pancakes, aren't you? And Tanya just said no. Fearing that what she had just said would stir suspicion, Tanya went to the living room and waited for the police to arrive at the front window. And finally, a police officer arrived, knocked on the door, and asked if she was Tanya Nicole Cash. She just said yes. And that's when the officers entered the home and arrested Tom Hose. When Eleanor asked the police what was going on, they said, quote, your son has been holding her in this house for over 10 years since she was 14 years old. And apparently Eleanor just said, okay. And then went to the kitchen and just stared out the window. And this is the final the... confirmation for me that I, I think she knew that something was going on. She was on. like, oh shit. Like It's yeah. over. Yeah, like the fact that all she could say was okay, I'm sure in her head. The, again, I think it's all the whole willful ignorance thing. She was like, damn. That girl really was up there that whole time. And she just went to look at the window and think about the past 10 years and every instance where she could have potentially like heard Tanya or heard something and just convinced herself otherwise. And you would think, well, shouldn't they be held responsible or liable for this or charged with a crime of some sort? Oh, I wish I had better news to share with you, but that is not what happens here. Tom begged the police to let him say something to Tanya before she left, but they just told him to shut the hell up, as they should. As Tanya left the Hose residence for the last time, Tom shouted, Judas! One last attempt at, like, let me tear you down one more time. You betrayed me. After giving an initial statement to the police, Tanya was finally picked up by her father, who had marked all 10 years, one month, and 11 days that Tanya had been missing. So fast forward to 2007, Tom Hose pleaded guilty to statutory sexual assault, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, indecent assault, and endangering the welfare of children, corruption of a minor, interference with the custody of children, and aggravated indecent assault. Judas Sokol, who you remember, literally allowed rape to happen in her house, knowingly, uh, and a pedophile, was sentenced only to 6 to 23 months in jail for her role in Tanya's captivity. Judith admitted to dyeing Tanya's hair in her initial statement, but recanted that story, citing memory problems. And we don't even know how long she even spent in prison. My guess, probably not that long. Not long enough, I should say. I, I would imagine it was closer to the six months uh, than the 23 Yeah, months. that's how I feel, especially when you hear uh, what Tom got. So... Tanya sued the city of McKeesport for not taking action to search for her. However, this lawsuit was thrown out, sadly. While Tanya was happy to be reunited with her father once he'd learned the terms of her imprisonment, he blamed her for her own experience. And this is what he said, quote, You're the one who left. And Joanne would tell her, quote, Well, you did this to yourself. How fucked up is that? And it just goes back to, you know, the attempted rape by her uncle where yeah they and they just, just like yeah yeah you're making this up like it's always them trying to push the blame off of them or off of anyone else and solely onto her yeah then it, then it gets worse in a documentary for people magazine joanne said that at first she believed tanya but then quote after i looked at the big picture things just weren't adding up what's not adding up for you please tell us and then in the same documentary, her father Jerry said, quote, Tom Hose may have psychologically trapped her, but if she was that unhappy, why did she not just leave? She could have left at any time. That's my belief. Does he under he doesn't understand any of this? No. It's like, did you even like read? Did you even listen to your own daughter about her experience? She could have explained all of it to you. Did you look into Stockholm Syndrome? Did you look into, you know, how how this happens all the time or you know more than just this one scenario this one case like there is a lot of cases of of stockholm syndrome like and to just dismiss all of that and be like well she could have you know she could have physically just got up and left and disregard all the even though he says psychologically trapped her he's contradicting himself right kind of in this statement well and it's like which is it man we were we were talking about this before like he, the, he literally ends the documentary, his last interview, by saying, like, the only piece of advice I have is that people should spend more time with their children. 
like I don't know. He's really <laughs> just Yeah, like, I don't know. I, I don't want to say like anything disparaging about him because obviously he went through something pretty horrible as well. Yeah, his but, daughter was missing for ten years. So it, that affects everybody differently and there could be different feelings about that. I think I just think some of the things he's saying is negating the the experience that your daughter went through and as a parent i just feel like you you should be your child's you know you're their guardian you you are their protector and if something like this happens to your your kid why on earth would you ever not be on their side why on earth would you never stand by them especially after you likely thought they might be dead and not, you know, she has to, she has to hear these things coming from her, you know, her father and her stepmom. So let's talk about some of the physical consequences of, of being held captive for 10 years. Tanya developed severe spine problems from maturing in Tom's cramped bedroom, diminished vision due to that untreated pink eye, and was diagnosed with PTSD, OCD, and other mental issues. Plus, she can no longer have children due to the sexual violence that Tom inflicted on her as a child. She literally had to have a hysterectomy. And he literally took that from her. That is, I mean, just, just utterly evil. Not only that, Tanya has also faced backlash from the McKeesport community. Auto mechanics overcharged her and told her they knew who she was. People yelled at her in the street, and the Methodist church she had attended while living with Tom has rejected her. Luckily, she's remained close friends with Joe Sparico, who is an absolute hero in this case, you know, along with Tanya, of course, a hero for surviving this and a survivor. And it's good to hear that at least the two of them have continued to remain friends and, and have continued seeing each other over the years. Tanya has continued to try to rebuild her life and build a sense of community and a family. In 2008, she started a relationship with a man named Carl, and the two married in 2018. Tanya, even after all of this, obtained her GED and continues to advocate for missing and exploited persons, which is, I mean, just so inspiring. And like I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, she released her memoir in 2017, Memoir of a Milk Carton Kid, co-authored by her lawyer, Lawrence Fisher. And this book is definitely, definitely worth reading. It's, I mean, you want to hear even more details than what we shared and just, you know, hear it from her perspective. I highly suggest you go and buy her book. It's on Amazon. We'll link it for you below. Definitely go and support her and uh, check out her her memoir. But when talking about her book, we have to mention that her family is already estranged and they were upset with the way that they were portrayed in her book. And Jerry said that after the book came out, relations between me and my daughter were completely severed. Tanya blamed me, she blamed Joanne, and she blamed everyone else. She had turned on every single one of us in that book. And after seeing their portrayal in the book, Jerry Cash and Joanne sued Tanya for defamation. A sheriff's deputy showed up at Tanya Cash's house with this, a summons notifying her that she was being sued by her own father and her stepmother. She says it broke her heart. My father would have paid attention and been a father to me, and this never would have happened to me. She says the joy of her reunion was short-lived. Behind closed doors, things went downhill again. My dad started blaming me for what happened, saying you knew what you were doing. I said, Dad, I was 14. And it's unclear what the results of this lawsuit were. And I hope that, you know, that didn't go anywhere. Because, again, I don't know exactly what things they referenced in this lawsuit um, as being defamation. But it's like, I think Tanya has a right to be upset with Jerry and Joanne. That's just me, though in my opinion. Wendy, last week, Tanya Cash's former therapist filed court papers saying she was suing Cash, her co-author and publisher, for defamation. The lawsuit apparently centering on statements made in this book that came out just last fall. I have a lot of anger, hatred. Uh, he's a monster. So whatever happened to Tom Hose? Well, Tom Hose ended up serving 15 years in prison and in 2022, he was released from prison 
and subsequently registered as a sex offender. Thomas Hose is now a free man after spending 15 years behind bars. He held Tanya Cash captive for a decade inside a McKeesport home. But this nasty, horrible, human monster of a person is getting out. You know, he, after what he has done, you know, it, I, it's, I'm scared that he might do it again. Tanya believes that he still lives in that same house on Soul Street. And, uh, you know, as Tanya stated in the People Magazine documentary, she lives 15 minutes away from him to this day, I believe. And maybe she's moved since then, but as far as we know, she's not that far away from him. And she even says, she's like, you know, it's terrifying to think that I could cross paths with this guy pretty much anywhere. You know what I mean? I get the grocery store. She could like turn a corner and there's Tom Hose right there. And I mean, Tom Hose is definitely getting up there in age at this point. Um, what would he be like in his sixties at this point? He would be in his seventies or yeah, probably closer to seventies. Right. But still, I mean, that's just terrible to think about. And of course people are going to be like, well, why don't she just move away? And And again, she had to literally like rebuild her life. She's got a GED, like it's got to be tough to like make and en- make ends meet. And she's estranged from her family. So it's like, it's probably been pretty damn hard to rebuild her life and, you know, try to try to move forward. You can't just like up and leave town necessarily, you know, especially if you've got, you know, got friends and family there and stuff. So, I mean, that's a, that's a really tough situation um, to end up in. And in my opinion, Tom Hose did not get the sentence that he deserved at all. They only got him for 15 years. Right. His lawyers even said like, this is a win in our book because he, he right. only got 15 years. Cause he, he did end up taking a plea deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, uh, and that plea deal, uh, allowed him to get that lesser sentence, which I think is completely messed up. And in my opinion, I think in Tanya's opinion, he should be in, prison for life. I mean, he is a danger to society. And again, we still don't know if he was responsible for those other two girls' murders. Those are still unsolved. But if you kind of like look at the the circumstances and you look at where the bodies were found and things that Tom has said, he may be responsible for those. We don't know. And the police certainly did not seem like they didn't really do a whole lot of investigating on those. I think they did try to do some DNA swabbing and stuff. They ran it through CODIS and there's no matches um, for foreign DNA they acquired uh, from the body. But again, the body's decomposed. I mean, very difficult to um, find any substantial evidence from that. But I can't help but think, you know, one of, the, one of the girls was literally found in the cemetery outside of Tom's house. What are the chances? What are the chances that another killer would do that? Right. I don't know, man. I, I think Tom could have been doing some other shit. Maybe before he took Tanya, he, you know, these were the other two girls. But again, this happened around the time that he did. One of them did. Yeah. So So that's not necessarily possible. But how do we know Tom, when he left the house for the day, was not doing something while at work or after work, he went and did something? I mean, we just don't know. And I would hope that the police would investigate that possibility. We don't know. We have no idea if they actually have looked down that road further. But, you know, he's only been, he's only served time for uh, the charges related to Tanya. But, I mean, it's also scary to think whoever did that to those poor girls is still out there. And there's still a killer, potentially serial killer out there is is terrifying. This is what I want to do is show people, you know, after something so tragic happened to you in your life that you can move on and, you know, and try and live a normal life. I hope that Tanya is doing well. And the best that she possibly can. I'm so happy that she was able to, you know, start, you know, have a family and and experience that. And, you know, I just wanted to put it out there and, you know, kind of wanted me to to mention this as well of like, Tanya, if you happen to run across this, this episode, we would love to have you on, have you come on the show and and share your own story. And I'm sure there's so much more that uh, we weren't able to get to in, in this episode today, but just wanted to put that invitation out there. We'd love to fly out here, have you have you on the show. Uh, I think it'd be um, extremely fascinating to to hear uh, your your story from from you. So 
But we're going to go on and wrap up today's episode there. Let us know your thoughts on this. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of thoughts and opinions on this and it's a, it's definitely a, a tough one, but I uh, appreciate you for joining us. Thanks for hanging with me. You know, Kendall should be back next week. So I know you all miss her. Hopefully I, I did, did it justice today. And thank you guys for uh, Ian and Janelle for helping me out today feel like this was still a really great episode so with that being said we'll see you guys next time 